first event at DUT to celebrate South African Library Week 2019. Uh, the Library and Information Association of South Africa is celebrating South African Library Week with the theme, Collaborate at Your Library, from the 18th to the 24th of March. And the launch event was held in the Free State a few days ago. And we have to ask the question, why collaborate with the libraries? Because libraries enhance the ability uh, of the communities that they serve. They increase, library weeks increase visibility of libraries and information services. They re-energize what we already have and make us more aware of them. And they channel the expertise of our society in a very concentrated uh, effort in one week. And if I were to encapsulate why we celebrate Library Week, it's because libraries contribute to the building of the nation and the improvement of, of the quality of life for all who use them. So I think that really encapsulates why we celebrate Libraries Week. To start this event, which is the first event in DUT celebration of Library Week, I'd like to um, introduce to you our Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor, Teaching and Learning, Professor Theo Andrew, who will do the official welcome to this event. Professor Andrew. Thank you, Navan. Um, good morning, folks. I, it's, it's, it's kind of romantic the way everybody's sitting around. And <laughs> all you need is a drink in your hand, um, coffee, tea, water. Whatever. Um, it's 10.31, so... Um, not too early. Yeah, not too early. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not too sure for what the solution is to the ESCOM crisis. I was approached um, at the beginning of the month by somebody that says that the Deputy President needed um, a list of names to work with ESCOM. Um, and that's on the way, you probably had announcements, but I think we're going to be in this position for a long time. Do you know what we used in South Africa before candles? Absolutely, electricity, you said it. <laughs> um, for Dr. Samuels, I think we have to introduce you to some alternative energy sources, <laughs> so you don't only rely on this. <laughs> um, Anyhow, it, it's really a privilege uh, to be here. I um, have a special place in my heart for libraries. I have to tell you uh, an early story. When I first um, got to university at Devon in 1976, um, people talked about the house of romance. And I'm kidding you, I didn't know what it was. we just come out of high school. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't take you very long to learn that what they're referring to is a library. <laughs> because uh, there were, if you, if you know the Devon Westfield Library, you had these study areas, uh, and you had all of these little corners over there, and that's where the couples would gather. <laughs> so they called it the House of Romance. Um, I, I see the, the library at DUT is kind of getting that way now. Even it was very much open. So. Um, but there's a, there's a special place in my heart for library because growing up uh, in a township uh, where they had no libraries and eventually they put libraries in and they put one swimming pool in, etc., etc. You come to realize uh, the power of knowledge. I'm not going to use the word information at this stage. I'm going to leave that to the guest speaker to talk about that. Um, and, and you come to realize the transformative nature of it because it empowers you in a very special way. Um, you have the freedom to uh, read a whole range of topics and disciplines. Um, uh, you, you, it really feels empowering in those days to have had a book in your hand. And in fact, uh, it still does, although we have computers and other reading devices. Um, if you go around the world, um, just as how you get um, city halls, uh, you also get state libraries, and if you look at the architecture of those buildings, uh, many of them are actually better than the city halls, right? Um, 
if you if you go to our Indomiso campus now, and if you look at the architecture of that particular building, uh, it gives you the kind of feel that you're at a university. If you went to the old Emil Sultan Library, not not the uh, the B M Patel Library where you are now, there was one before that. Um, it you kind of felt like um, this could be anyway, and so the hallmark of uh, any learning institute um, is the library, not just what's in the library, but the signature building of the library as well. And that's important because it, it reflects to society uh, the importance of what's inside of the building. Um, uh, when we had our orientation uh, at university, I still remember, it took me some time to catch up. The first question, which is the tallest building at the university? And we all thought it was the L block. And someone said it's a library. And we looked at it and said, it's bizarre. It's only three floors. Well, it has the most number of stories, so it was the tallest building. So th there's all kinds of stories and jokes about libraries. So um, at DUT, uh, I know that Lucille uh, and a team uh, and her predecessors took the library very seriously. In fact, they, you will never hear the story of the shortage of resources, um, and, and rightly so, because somehow we lost the mission, and we, we don't see the library as a very strategic investment. Um, but at DUT, I think there's been lots of resources put into it, and I'm sure you can do it much more. Right? Yes. Um, um, more importantly, it's really kept up to pace with what's happening around the world um, with respect to uh, libraries or information resources. So we have a number of people here. I don't want to take too much of time. Uh, first, let me welcome uh, Professor Joanda Duber uh, from UNISA. I'm not going to say too much because I think Dr. Samuels will introduce her just now. Um, I'm going to make one comment. I asked her a question. Is, is there an alternative word to decolonization? Because it is such an important um, uh, concept. Uh, it is such an important driver for transformation uh, in all aspects of our society, but sometimes um, it kind of has a negative connotation because somebody asked the question, when will we know that we are a decolonized society? And in that expression, there's quite a bit of negativity. It's like saying the white, non-white thing, right? You, you don't want to be the negative of the other. So um, I'm, I'm quite curious to, to listen to her presentation. Um, Prof, welcome to Durban. Um, we apologize for what you're seeing here, and, uh, but I'm sure you get this at UNISA as well, it's all over the country. And uh, I want to wish you the best um, in your address. We also have invited guest speakers from, uh, apart from UNISA, from UKZN, um, University of Kwasulu Natal. Um, we have uh, representatives from Mangsudi University of Technology. Uh, we have folks from ILIS, I think that's the School Library Association. Um, and then we have representatives from the City Library or Itikwani Library as well. Uh, I have to mention the colleagues from the Library Information Systems Department, um, uh, Dr. Sentu and, um, and the folks that came with him. Um, it's, uh, it's departments like these that uh, provide the human capital um, for libraries around the world uh, to continue. So I hope you have a great time. And um, I will now hand over to Dr. Samuels. I want to congratulate uh, Lucille Webster for the Library Week. Uh, it's really fantastic that you do this. I know how passionate you are. Uh, and when I look at the program, I would like to say on behalf of management, uh, well done, and you have all our support. Thank you, Professor Andrew. My job here at DUT is Director of International Education and Partnership, so it's only fitting that I reflect on what Professor Andrew said from an international perspective. 
one of the universities that I visited recently was Uppsala University in Sweden. The library at Uppsala University is 700 years old, and they have had a chief librarian for 690 years. It's the oldest post at the university other than the post of rector, and it's a celebrated post, so much so that every year there's a celebration where the chief librarian comes out onto the balcony of his or her office and greets the community of the town of Uppsala because it represents the link between the knowledge domain of the town and the town itself. So it's very really symbolic and I think it, it epitomizes everything that Professor Andrew said about the role of the library at a university but also the role of the library in society in general. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker, Professor Duyang Dube. Professor Dube is the chair in the Department of Information Science at the University of South Africa. Her academic career spans over 20 years, wherein she taught in several institutions and has published extensively in accredited national and international journals. She has also supervised and examined masters and doctoral candidates. Her areas of interest are information and knowledge management, indigenous knowledge systems, library and information science curriculum transformation, and libraries for development. She is a champion of maximizing human capital at all fronts. To sustain her footprint beyond the academy, her current interest pursuits is in decolonizing knowledge and spearheading transformation of the African information and knowledge for meaningful global impact. Like you can hear, she's a prolific researcher and author who has published extensively nationally and internationally, and she's a full professor at the University of South Africa. I feel extremely honored to present Professor Dube, who will present a lecture on never neutral, decolonized libraries as a motor for expansive change in our lives. Please give a warm DUT welcome to Professor Dubey. Thank you, Chairperson, for the introduction. And also thank you to Professor Your Andrew for the welcome. I will start by my presentation by acknowledging Deputy Vice Principal, Professor Pio Andrew, who is DVC Teaching and Learning, Professor Sibu Moyo, DVC Research and Innovation, the Executive Director of Library Services, Mrs. Webster, Library Management, Heads of Academic Departments, Directors of Entities and Sections, Academic Staff, library staff, and all other categories of staff, students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Um, I am used to this. I am used to load shedding. <laughs> <laughs> Colleagues were apologizing, and I was saying, don't apologize. I'm a South African. I'm used to this, because this has become part of our life. Before I start, I want to say all protocol of death. I was born and bred in Mount Fletcher in the Eastern Cape. And in one of the political meetings, an elderly woman was sitting in a corner somewhere. And as you know, with political meetings, people will say, the mayor, the councillor, this and that, all protocol of death. And when it was the opportunity for this lady to speak, she also wanted to do as the other people have done. So she went on the mayor, the councillor, this and that. And then she forgot the last statement. And she ended up saying, all potholes. <laughs> <laughs> At the outset, Chairperson, let me express my sincere appreciation for the honor I have been given to deliver this lecture as part of the South African Library Week celebrations. I have also been told that DUT Library is launching a library space today. 
I want to congratulate the library, Ms. Webster, for, for extending and diversifying its reach. And I'm delighted to witness the event. And uh, the thesis that gave impetus to this lecture is the South African Library Week theme. The theme is collaborate at your library. In response to the theme, the title of my presentation is Decolonize the Libraries as a motto for expansive change in our lifetime. And I believe that the title embraces the theme. I heard you, I take your sentiments, uh, Professor Andrew, about negativity, but I want to assure you that decolonization is not about separating people according to race. It does not have that negative connotation. Instead, it's about inclusive, inclusivity. It is about multiplicity. It is about pluralism accommodating other realities out. As I begin this lecture, I begin with a quote from Maya Angelou. The quote says, a bird does not sing because it has answers. It sings because it has a song. I therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I do not claim to have all the answers, but I'm hoping that the lecture will instigate new ways of thinking. It will extend the traditional understanding of our roles and responsibilities as LIS practitioners. I also hope that it will contribute towards revitalizing conversations and reflections on the importance of libraries as institutions of influence. I will start by setting the scene. Despite the end of Western imperialism, Afri Africa remains in the shackles of oppression. And this is expressed in a lot of literature. There are a lot of people who have written about this. The African continent is one of the largest continents with the vast mineral resources, but it is still regarded as a dark continent with the poorest people in the world. These are the sentiments of Professor Gugi Wationgo. He was presenting a lecture at Vets University in 2017, and he mentioned this. Africa faces challenges, ladies and gentlemen, such as dependency on the West, we are facing challenges of war, political instability, displacement, poverty, disease, corruption, illiteracy, inequality, poor quality of education, brain drain, underdevelopment, and many other challenges. Although there are calls that have been made about advancing African Renaissance and renewal, very little has changed. Other authors say it is the economic and psychological oppression that still lingers on. And in this regard, Pra cautions that an African Renaissance cannot be built on cultural borrowings from outside, but must rather be based on the rediscovery of Africa's own culture and history. What this means is that without meaningful self-discovery and affirmation, Africa will continue to be unable to fully meet the physical, developmental, and intellectual needs of its people. Like Africa, South Africa is facing its own challenges, such as high levels of crime, violence against women and children, high levels of unemployment, high levels of illiteracy, poverty, corruption, economic and political instability, 
land distribution, governance, load sharing, of course, <laughs> service delivery protests, and other and many others. President Ramaphosa speaks of a new dawn, and he is championing the Tuma Mina campaign. The question is, can LIS practitioners individually and, co and collectively contribute to the greater good of the country? If so, how? In the midst of all this, ladies and gentlemen, the world is excited about the fourth industrial revolution. The question that I want to ask is, as Africans, are we ready for the revolution? Where are we currently? Are we in the second revolution or third revolution? Are we ready then to embrace the fourth industrial revolution? This fourth industrial revolution is here. And the question that I want to ask, how can we use it to develop inclusive economies? The lecture, ladies and gentlemen, was informed by different frameworks. The framework that I used to inform this lecture is the Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted in 2015 by the United Nations General Assembly. The African Union Agenda 2063. The South African National Development Plan the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa together with the Bill of Rights. I also used Ranganathan's Five Laws of Librarianship. I think all librarians will know the laws of Ranganathan. The laws are books are for use. Every person, his or her book, every book is a reader. Save the time of the reader. The library is a growing organism. Mrs. Webster, you are introducing a space. The library is a growing organism. In addition to that, I was also informed by IFLA guidelines, the ASA goals, and the South African LIS Transformation Charter. I want to start, ladies and gentlemen, by mapping out the traditional role Library. Libraries are, get, are gateways to knowledge. Professor Andrew mentioned earlier that he would prefer to use the term knowledge compared to information. I will also use the term knowledge because, in my view, knowledge includes information. Because knowledge, you have tacit, you have explicit. So information is part of knowledge. And I think knowledge is appropriate to cover all the resources and services that libraries offer. So, the definition of libraries is that they are get gateways to knowledge. They are repositories to knowledge. They are designed to perform specific functions, such as social functions, informational functions, educational functions, recreational functions, cultural functions, conversational functions, and research functions. And this definition I took from authors like Alemna, De Botton, Maxwell Smith, and Rose, Rose Blum. The question is, what is knowledge? Knowledge, colleagues, is defined by Shapira as the combination of human resource capital. <laughs> knowledge is the technology and information capital. It is about the leadership assets and experience. It is about intellectual property. It is about informational stocks. It is about collaborative relationships and capabilities. All these are meant to enhance development. Knowledge is good if it is viable. It is good if it works and when it allows people to achieve their goals. Now, coming back to the focus of the lecture. Colonization 
imposed foreign knowledge on Africa and suppressed indigenous knowledge. Colonization accorded Western knowledge dominance. It accorded Western knowledge credibility, worthiness, legitimation. That is according to Wayne. Because of colonization, Western knowledge was regarded as the truth because it was also regarded as being scientific because others argue that indigenous knowledge is not scientific. Because of this, Western knowledge has been given or it has been regarded as having universal applicability. This is problematic because knowledge is grounded on contextual demands and realities. Knowledge embeds culture. It embeds language. It embeds values, norms, traditions, and persuasion of its publics. The imposition, therefore, of foreign knowledge meant the imposition of a foreign way of Unfortunately, knowledge operates at the level of internalized domination, that is subtle. Hence, its ability to continue routine behavior without resistance or ag agitation is very high. In the words of Steve Beagle, I quote, the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. What is the value of knowledge? Why am I bothered about knowledge? Knowledge is a critical driver and core, it is core to economic development. It is a tool that is very useful, that is critical in the knowledge economy. Having said that, I mentioned earlier on that libraries are gateways to knowledge. What is the perception about libraries? There is a view, ladies and gentlemen, that libraries, like religious institutions, were at the heart of the colonial enterprise. This means that they were used as tools of oppression. There is a strong view also that knowledge continues to be a tool of oppression, resulting in the oppression of other knowledges, other realities, and other truths that are out there. That is why, Professor Andrews, I talked about inclusivity. I talked about multiplicity. Mudimbe alleges that libraries continue to protect and extend the reach of the Western epistemological order. In the same vein, Rose Blum says that libraries have been advancing at affordances of ignorance. Scott criticizes libraries strongly when she says, the profession of librarianship itself has been critiqued for its political naivety. The profession has been critiqued for failing to confront important social questions. And in all this, the library sector, we can all agree, has struggled with the image, with the problem of image and status. Libraries, ladies and gentlemen, have been, have defended themselves. And one of the excuses that they have advanced is the issue of neutrality. Alemna says, neutrality is even seen as a virtue amongst the question is, as part of systems and societies that are not neutral, 
Can libraries be neutral? Should they be neutral? Are they apolitical? And the neutrality of libraries is in three dimensions. They are neutral in terms of the services that they are offering. They are neutral in terms of the collections. They are neutral in terms of access. And to justify neutrality, others talk of active neutrality, others talk of ethical neutrality. Critics of library neutrality say the myth of neutrality prevents an engaged profession. Okay, sorry. The myth of neutrality prevents an engaged professional conversation with our diverse community. Also, the critics say, when libraries frame disengagement as neutrality, they ignore the core values of librarianship and they allow inequality to persist. That is according to Jensen. Personally, I also contest neutrality based on the fact that knowledge is not neutral. It has its own biases. It has its own prejudices, orientations, cultures that it seeks to advance. Libraries are constructive and disruptive institutions in reality. They are not neutral. For an example, I heard in the news that one of the ISIS recruits went to the library to read about ISIS, to gather more information about the organization. So libraries cannot, in my view, be neutral because the knowledge that they have is not neutral. Over the years, colleagues, Libraries have been challenged to, to evolve beyond the buildings, the collections, the policies. They have been challenged to be social institutions serving communities who are seeking the most fundamental human quest, that is the quest for meaning. What this means is that Libraries need to be more than distributors of knowledge. They need to be more than the knowledge, the middlemen. They need to focus on the relevance of the content in terms of language and in terms of form. They also need to focus on accessibility of that particular content that is physical and intellectual accessibility. Chairperson, this brings us to a core question. How do libraries decide on the acquisition of knowledge resources? The acquisition decisions, are they driven by supply or by demand? Are libraries buying what is available in the market? or do they solicit information for, from suppliers? Which lens are librarians using when they buying material? Are they using the African lens or are they using the Western lens? These are questions that libraries need to ask themselves when they are buying material. Whose knowledge is worth it? whose knowledge matters, and the knowledge is for whom, by whom, for what purpose. What is the place of indigenous knowledge in our collections? Who decides on the legitimacy of knowledge? What counts as legitimate knowledge? Which language is this knowledge presented? and whose language? Where are the African voices in our collection? In our collections? 
in which form is the knowledge packaged? Is it printed? Is it electronic? Who benefits from the knowledge that the library provides? Is it the user or is it the publisher? Does the knowledge advance social justice? What values are libraries upholding? Are they upholding their own values or the values of the community? To what extent do libraries respond to the sustainable development goals? To what extent do they respond to the national development plan? And embedded in this, in the provision of knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, is the issue of power. There is an old saying that knowledge is power. Knowledge production is a business is a business owned and monopolized by media conglomerates and publishing houses. In the production of knowledge, there is a continued dominance of north-south links. And this demonstrates reliance on Western knowledge. Meaning that the, the, the information or the knowledge that we have in most of our libraries comes from the north to the south. So there is that dominance that continues. Even in the academic environment, the business of publishing has its own politics. If you want to publish an article, it's not easy. Because others say in the publishing, in academic publishing, there is what is called the old boys club, where there are gatekeepers who are preventing new entrants from entering. Ladies and gentlemen, I think there is a need to introduce south-south links in terms of knowledge production. There is also a need to facilitate south-north links. I am not suggesting, Chairperson, that all Western knowledge is colonizing us. I am not suggesting that all the knowledge is bad and it must be thrown away. I am just advocating for in multiplicity and the inclusion of other knowledges including indigenous knowledge. I am advocating for reconsideration of collection development policies, library processes, procedures, and practice. It is important that as libraries, we should be asking these questions because libraries are expected, ladies and gentlemen, to contribute to the building of an informed and educated nation. Libraries are not just about increasing their collections. They have to make sure that these collections are accessible physically and intellectually. These collections are relevant in terms of content, language, and form. These collections are responsive to the African and South African problems that I mentioned earlier. Libraries have to make sure that the collections are usable. In a time when libraries are faced with dwindling budgets, it is critical that they justify their worth according to the principle of return on investment. Chisita, therefore, suggests that libraries need to be decolonized. He suggests that they need to be decolonized so that they can be part of a public value.
value system that seeks to solve social problems. Libraries have to rethink and reframe their purpose. They have to try and, and address social justice. They have to try and provide value-based practice, impact-based practice, and problem-solving practice. Libraries need to develop strategies to contribute to sustainable development by providing information that will provide solutions to African problems. As I have mentioned, they used to provide value-based practice. In collaboration with academics, they used to conduct, they need to conduct value-driven research. Libraries cannot do this alone. I am part of the LIS school, and I see Dr. Sento here as part of the LIS school, the LIS sector. Dr. Sento, we have a responsibility to make sure that we transform the curriculum. We need to conduct research that will inform practice. We need to collaborate with the library and we need to conduct research together. If there is that collaboration between academics and the libraries, we are likely to see sustainable librarianship. If there is that collaboration between libraries and academics, we are likely to mitigate the North dominance by strengthening South-South links and South-North links. We need also, as a profession and as a country, to desist from knowledge dependency. We need to influence and redevelop the production, the dissemination, the commercialization, the legitimation, the ranking, and acceptance of knowledge. As libraries, we are placed in a critical position where we can influence the knowledge producers. We have that power of influence. So we therefore need to influence the knowledge that they produce. We also have to influence the commercialization of knowledge and the ranking of knowledge. We need to strengthen the African voice in our collections by procuring more indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge must not only be recognized, but must be developed, collected, organized, and made accessible. More importantly, as Africans, we need to grow from consumers of information to creators of information. We are downloaders more than uploaders. So we need to create our own knowledge. We need to appreciate our knowledge and we need to take ownership of that knowledge. Libraries need to refocus the existing efforts. They need to refocus user-centeredness. Libraries need to develop a new library where everybody is a client. At the moment, most libraries are serving users that are coming to the library. The majority of people out there in South Africa are not library users, and therefore they are not served by the library. The new library needs to have everybody as a client. 
and for us to extend the reach, for us to ensure penetration and precision, we have to look at the collections that we currently have. Because if the collections are not serving the needs of the people out there, the likelihood of them coming to use our libraries are very, very minimal. We need to collaborate. Collaboration is important. Partnerships are very important between the library, the communities, the academics, the information producers, the publishers, the technologies, the users, civil organizations, and many other stakeholders. It is important that we collaborate because as libraries, we cannot do this on our own. That is why I said the theme of the South African National Library Week is important because it talks about collaboration. And I'm also a speaking to that because collaboration is important. Collaboration with communities, ladies and gentlemen, is important. We should involve our communities at the collection development level so that we can create a symbiosis between libraries and communities. As librarians, there is a lot that we need to do. We need to deconstruct our mental frames. We need to unlearn and relearn. We need to reskill and upskill. In most African universities, Librarians hold an academic status and as such librarians are expected to have masters and doctoral and doctorate. Maybe in South Africa we need to do that too. Because if librarians have a master's and a doctorate, then they will be able to conduct research. Because if we are to be developers of information, we need to know how to conduct research. Ladies and gentlemen, libraries also need to reframe their work for the fourth industrial revolution. We need to provide a hybrid environment. We need to have web presence and visibility. I saw Mrs. Webster, the space downstairs has computers, so you are doing this, providing a hybrid environment. <laughs> Digital skills are also necessary for librarians in order to create information and knowledge. And it is also important, one of the important points is space. Space is critical. This space must be mountable, it must be demountable, and it must be retractable in order to serve the needs of the community. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I want to say that the LIS profession needs to stop debating about whether to be neutral or not. We need to start conversing about how to use our own power to shape a better society. If libraries are to remain relevant in the 21st century, they need to be part of a public value system that seeks to solve social problems. The problems of this century cannot be solved 
by individual efforts, but they can only be solved by collaboration and partnership, as suggested by the theme of the Library Week. The last thought that I have on this lecture I, is by Maya Angelou. I started with Maya Angelou, and I'm going to conclude with her. She says, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, it need not be lived again. Let me once again, Chairperson, take the opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers of the event for inviting me to deliver this lecture. I hope that it had been thought-provoking and it will enable further discussions to it will end, enable further discussions from this. I had a PowerPoint presentation. The fact that I cannot show that PowerPoint event in presentation in a way affected my presentation, but it's okay. Thank you very much, Ndia Bonga, Ndia Bulena. I have a list of references that I have used for the lecture. Thank you very much. very much, Professor Dube. It was indeed thought-provoking. It was hugely insightful. And I think it had all the marks of an academic paper because it got us thinking about a whole lot of issues that are currently part of our discourse. And I think it's a very significant contribution to the discourse that we are having at the moment around decolonizing the curriculum here at DUT. And we know that it's a complex multi-layered issue and having the contribution that we've just heard helps us in our understanding of taking this uh, forward. It's also a discourse that we're having around the fourth industrial revolution that the paper touched on that is really important. In addition, we are, we are, re we are reflecting on the sustainable development goals and how we can actually embed it into the activities here at UT. And I think all of you are aware that we're currently engaged in a planning process to look at a DUT strategic plan from 2020 to 2030. And the contribution made by Professor Duba is something that we will reflect on as we plan going forward. I think equally important is to speak about a public value system because that is also an issue we are grappling with as a society. We are seeing our values being eroded we are seeing things that we hold dear to us being grasped away from us. And so all of these issues have come together in this really thought-provoking paper. So thank you very much for that, Professor Dubek. Before I get our library director, Mr. Webster, to do the vote of thanks, we have um, a gift that we would like to hand over. And I will now call Siabonga and Dwala and Walani. Siabonga. Ah, Siabonga. is a student, uh, was a student here at DUT. He then became part of a project at DUT to incubate his business. He is now a DUT entrepreneur, and his manufacturing business is based here at DUT, and he has something called the Turn Up Speaker. It is technology coming together with entrepreneurship and innovation we are very proud of the work that Sia Bonga does. So I will now ask Sia Bonga to hand over the gift to Professor Duve. Professor Duve, please step forward.
who will do the vote of thanks and also some presentations. And I'd like to use this opportunity to congratulate Mrs. Webster and the library staff for an excellent start to Library Week. It is not only an engagement which is enriching and stimulating, but it is academic discourse that is so necessary for our university, and it epitomizes everything that a library should be about. So congratulations, Mrs. Webster, and it's my pleasure to give the podium to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Samuels. Colleagues, it's such a pleasure to see so many familiar faces, ex-staff members, colleagues from across KwaZulu-Natal, and of course, it was a great honor to host and have Dr. Luyanda Dube do our special lecture for us today. Just for information, this is the first public lecture that is hosted by the library. So we've really made some history here today. And of course, Eskom joined us by putting off the lights so that we could concentrate. <laughs> um, it is my great pleasure to say thank you so much to the library task team. We have a task team that was dedicated to work toward, on our public lecture program. And this was done, I'm sure you will agree with me very well, and under the leadership of Caesar Adebe. If you can stand. <laughs> and his team. The corporate affairs, I would like to thank Alan Khan and his representative, Jabu Gumede, who has also joined us in the staff team and other staff members. Just look for the staff with a blue t-shirt. Charlotte will stand for you, as you can see. Yes, and th those are the task team members. I will read out their names. Bongi, Lindiwe, Dennis, and Tlantla. Thank you very much. You guys did us proud. Of course, this would not have done, if, would not have worked if we didn't also have our marketing committee on board. So libraries have lots of subcommittees. And I would like to just say thank you to Bongi, Monde, Kasturi, Ntlantla, Prashant, Cebu, Ntutu, Rino, and Caesar. Thank you so much, colleagues. This space that you see, we did not just design the space from a blueprint. We consulted. Part of the information came out of our annual um, surveys that we do with different groups who use our library. But we also use our staff to tell us what our space, what they think our space should look like. So we have this committee called the Space Committee. And no, they're not going to Mars. <laughs> But the space committee helped refurbish the space, as you see it here, in terms of ideas and suggestions and the way our spaces should, should look. And uh, so I would like to thank that committee as well for the input. Thank you very much. Then, um, last but not least, the DUT infrastructure team. I'm talking about the executive director, um, Dr. Gob Chetty, the DUT planner, um, Len Rosenberg, the maintenance team, the air conditioning team, and just everybody who assisted in getting our spaces where we want th that to be. Um, it's unfortunate that the power outage came sort of at 10 o'clock, so you didn't really have an, uh, a chance to, to look at all the re review, uh, renewed spaces that we have. The basement space is absolutely amazing. So yes, thank you very much for that. Um, the speech by Prof. Dube was absolutely thought-provoking, and I'm hoping as practicing librarians and prospective librarians that you are taking note of it. Some of the things that she said was a bit of an indictment on our profession, but we mustn't deny things that have happened. I would like to say that librarians now have more of a backbone and that we do engage with current 
events, affairs, political scenarios, etc. An example is the fact that our LIASA, which is the Library and Information Association of South Africa, we have linked up with the UN Sustainable Goals. So we're not burying our heads in sand. We are very much aware of what should be done and how we need to change our spaces and our profession. Um, if I think back to the 1980s when I was a young librarian at the then University of, Kuzu, F, of University of Natal, Harvard College, I like to think, yes, perhaps we didn't have the backbone there. I remember clearly every Friday, and so people who have a certain age will remember that. Dr. Sintra, you're too young, but certainly Mrs. Miller will remember that and some other librarians. <laughs> on a Friday, on a Friday, the Government Gazette would come out, as you recall. Because universities have been seen to be instrumental in almost advocating and supporting these uprisings. Remember, we were in the height of the apartheid era and also resistance to apartheid in the 1980s. So in the 1980s, this list will come out. It will go directly to the library director and he would commandeer some senior staff and they would go to the shelves and they would pull off books that the government at that time said, you do not, you must not read this. Do some of you remember that they banned Black Beauty about the wars? Do you remember? <laughs> so yes, I think the librarians of today are definitely not as submissive as the librarians of those years were. I think we are a little bit more open-minded and we we are not scared to um, let our views be known. So once again, Prof, thank you so much for your presentation. There's been lots of food for thought and, and things that we should engage in. Just as a last aside, and this one is for DUT, I would like to say before decolonization became a hot topic, we at the, universe, at the library decided in the early 2000s that um, looking at our collection, remember our brief was to not, our brief is to um, create an informed and educated nation by providing information resources and contributing to knowledge generation, etc., etc. So in the early 2000s, we decided after looking at our collection, and I think Mrs. Muller was still part of the library at that stage, we looked at our collection and we saw our fiction collection consisted of Shakespearean plays, the Frederick Fossites, the Mills and Boons, and very little about South African or African authors produced by people from the continent. And so at that stage, we decided to set up aside a certain portion of our collection budget to Africanize our uh, fiction collection. And we decided to invite African and South African authors to come and speak about their books because we certainly felt that our students needed to be become aware of, of the knowledge and the authors that we have here that they were not. Because again, as Prof said, we kept on having this view to the north and completely forgetting about what is here in the south. So that was just as an aside. Um, now is my chance to just say thank you so much again to Prof Dube and to provide her with a, a gift from the, from, for the, from the library.
also like to just thank uh, Dr. Laverne for being the program director for the day and issue him with a small gift. to the solution of how to decolonize knowledge in our libraries. I, I would love to, to actually plead to the policy makers or the policy influencers that as much as they should actually come up with a policy where it says that in our library spaces, there should be at least 50% of sources that comes from or are written by South African authors it should be a norm that it should at least be 50%, if not more, than to actually find in our library spaces, to find more of Western. That is how we're actually gonna be, decolon you know, we're gonna be colonized, because it's not what we write, it's not things that are really relevant to South Africans or Africans as such. So to policy makers, Dr. Sento, and <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll just, I'll just love to actually get that there should be at least of our resources in our library spaces. Thank you. Go ahead. Perhaps you can step this way so that we may be able to see you and oh, you to see you. <laughs> No, it's fine. My name is Nongta Bumsoki. I am a public management and economics student in DUT. I think in as much as I have a, a comment, but it's going to also come with a, a question. You know, uh, firstly, let us uh, appreciate the work that the library has, has conducted today in the public lecture. We appreciate that at least the program of transformation of the institution, we can see it uh, through various means. But however, as a student, I'm hi highly concerned. I think the last speaker, um, the last speaker actually did the, the who was doing the vote of thanks. I, I don't know the name. Mrs. Uh, Webster. Mrs. Webster. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Mrs. Webster made it very clear that there was a consultation process that took place in the university uh, for us to be able to give such such just such space in the in, in the library. But <clears throat> if we are to speak about decolonization, it is coming to be it's becoming a term that has been destructed, constructed in many forms and many concepts and, and it also comes with different perceptions. For instance, I'm quite concerned that children or students with disabilities are not considered in terms of the construction of this campus. When you enter here, they don't have access to take books which are very high up. There's no system in which they themselves, without any voluntary basis at the desk, they can access those books for them to even go down at the computer labs, there is no lift. Even when they're at the computer labs, even if you take them through their wheelchairs, you take them down at the computer labs, even the desks are not conducive for students who have disability. Now, when we speak about decolonization, decolonization cannot participate in discrimination of particular students over the other. But second to that, the library, when we speak about decolonization, it must also speak about content in the library. We appreciate 50%, my colleague has introduced us as, as presented here. We appreciate all of those niche initiatives in the fiction section, there's African authors and all of those. But why do, do does the library service or the institution have to lie to us as students? 
The output of students in the university is the working class. They are expected to go to the market and they are going to be workers of this country and are going to be oppressed. The content in this library is content that is allowing those who are going to be future entrepreneurs, future business owners, to in fact contribute to the oppression of other workers over the other. What is the content of this library that speaks about liberation of the workers, the future, which is us, by the way. We are the ones that are going to be participating in the market, uh, in the market labor, as we are moving out of the university. So I'm very concerned about the concept of decolonization if we are not going to speak about class perspective, but secondly, if there's going to be a marginalization and discrimination over the other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, given the time constraints, we'll give Professor Dube a chance to answer those questions. Here's one more question. Okay. Mr. Hempson, if you can. Yeah. Um, I, I found you know, those last comments really very, very interesting because I think it, it goes to what uh, a University of Technology uh, is for and, and how come we accepted uh, the fact that uh, critical questions are not part of the curriculum in a, in a, with the emphasis on technical matters only. I think it's a very valid point. Um, I, I wanted to ch challenge a bit the, the notion of Western knowledge. Um, because I think the points about the imposition of knowledge, the marginalization of people are absolutely correct. But we don't nowadays actually have a system of Roman numerals as for our number system. We use Arabic numerals. And those numerals were developed, you could say, at some point part of African indigenous knowledge, but were then ado adopted because of their, their strength and, and their effectiveness into what we may now see as Western knowledge. So one mustn't um, ignore the fact that what is called Western knowledge has actually drawn significantly uh, on places like Mali, which, which had the earliest universities and so on. Um, I also think that relevant in our history is the struggle of African communities in particular in the 50s to challenge the way in which their access to this so-called Western knowledge was being blocked by the apartheid government. Um, and just a note to um, uh, our librarian on, on, on librarians and, and, uh, and the past under apartheid. <laughs> My brother wrote to me recently, he was put on a banning order and house arrest in 1974. But he was allowed to go to libraries. And he'd go to the municipal library, still segregated at that time in Durban. But when the security police arrived to look for him, the librarians had a system of alerting him so he could get out of another exit. So there were subtle forms of resistance in the system. <laughs> to just, um, and this is not being a defensive response, I would just like to say that we do have um, a committee in place that looks after the needs of, of our students. In fact, every year we get a list from our MIS with the, uh, the numbers of, of disabled students per site so that we can see how we can change our, our access and assistance for the uh, differently abled students. Um, unfortunately, the, the space that we inherited, that we took over with effect from this year, down in the basement, unfortunately, the space is just not conducive to get the person uh, in a wheelchair down into that space. But it is something that that committee is working on in terms of alternative um, um, measures to get there. Likewise, the um, desks, um, that are adjustable um, and slightly different for the differently abled students. This library in particular has always had the desk and I, I remember when I was the manager here, I would go to the students um, who are not differently abled, who have commandeered those and we used to put a big sign there and say, this desk is reserved for someone in a wheelchair. Um, I would just like to, so, just to add again, I'm not being defensive, but really, I would really like that if you as a student see a lack in our services, 
talk to us. And if you see something that's flagrantly going wrong, let us know. Because I can assure you, um, access for the differently able is, is very passionately driven by our subcommittee. And I think the chair for that is Cesar Adebe. And he really, I've seen the work that they've done. Thank you. I'm now going to give Professor Dube a chance to respond. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. Most, uh, most of the comments were, or most of the interventions were comments. The first speaker mentioned having a quota in the library, 50%. I'm not sure about that, but I think if the library commits to ensuring that the collections become diversified and inclusive, because colleagues, decolonization is about inclusivity. It is about recognizing that there are other knowledges out there. So whatever is out there, must also be included. And also, when it comes to the Western knowledge say, that has drawn from Africa, that is very true because there are people who argue that civilization started in Africa. Be that as it may, I think we are at a stage where colonization took over everything, and it was imposed on us. Remember that we don't have to agree on this, because it depends where you are, and it depends on the lens that you are using to look at this. Libraries have had certain forms of resistance. I know that Archie Dick wrote also an article about libraries, I think in Cape Town, who during the period of apartheid used to participate in, in politics to make sure that the political agenda is advanced. So I am not denying that. But what I'm saying is that overall, most libraries are not doing enough. That is my argument. And when it comes to the issue of disability, it is in line with decolonization because everybody has to be included. Everybody has to be has to be taken care of. But I'm glad Mrs. Webster, you are promising this audience that the DOT library is doing everything possible to ensure that everybody is included. Thank you very much.